My name is Josiah Neely. I'm a policy analyst at TPPF in our Energy and the Environment uh, Department. I'm an attorney, native Austinite. Uh, I'd like to welcome you here this morning uh, for the introductory first set of panels on energy uh, and unleashing the Texas Energy Colossus. Um, and I think I'd like to begin, uh, I was listening to uh, Joshua Trevino. He has all these literary references that he works into his conversations and discussions. So I have a couple of literary references uh, <laughs> that I'm, I'm going to work. You know, two quotes come to mind when it comes to, to energy. The first is, of course, uh, the classic opening of A Tale of Two Cities. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times, uh, which in the case of energy, you know, it's certainly the last few years have seen really uh, an unprecedented boom in oil and gas. Uh, think about the new technologies that are being or old technologies that are now being harnessed in new ways, uh, like uh, horizontal drilling, fracturing, et cetera, that have expanded uh, the shale gas and uh, the different plays uh, and really have been, uh, have uh, game-changing implications for energy going forward. Uh, but it's also, you know, a time of uh, worry and concern on the horizon with a lot of EPA regulation and, and potential regulation concerns there. Um, the other quote is from that great uh, philosopher Yogi Berra, which is, uh, be careful about making predictions, especially about the future. And, you know, I can remember, it was only a couple years ago when, you know, people were talking about permanently high natural gas prices. Um, and the current uh, natural gas, uh, the oil and gas uh, shale boom, really took a lot of people by surprise, I think because it was a result not of any sort of uh, central plan or government plan, but it was a result of uh, market forces. Um, and so that's an important thing that we need to be keeping in mind here. So we have a great panel to talk about, you know, the, the energy boom, what does it mean, how can it be sustained, what are the, what are the implications uh, that it has and how we need to react. Uh, starting out, uh, and I'm going to, I'll introduce all the panelists and then uh, we can just go uh, into their talks. Uh, John Hayes is an a oil and gas attorney. He's, uh, he practices law with Hayes and Owen LLP here in Austin. Uh, he is also an adjunct at uh, the University of Texas. He teaches on these issues uh, and has presented numerous papers on energy law regulation and litigation. Uh, and then Commissioner Christy Craddock uh, was just last year elected to the Texas Railroad Commission. My staff are in the room. Yeah. <laughs> uh, a native of Midland, uh, prior to becoming Chris, uh, commissioner, uh, she was a small business owner and attorney specializing in oil and gas, water, and tax issues. Uh, and she was a legal advisor to Speaker of the House, Tom Craddock, from 2002 to 2011. Um, our third panelist was going to be uh, Representative Myra Crownover. Uh, Representative Crownover, unfortunately, has been delayed. Uh, she uh, has a meeting at the Capitol. Uh, she said that she will try to be here. But uh, in her absence, uh, Kathleen Hartnett White, who is the distinguished senior fellow <laughs> and director of the Armstrong Center for Energy and the Environment, and my boss. Uh, is here. Uh, Kathleen is a former uh, chairman of TCEQ and uh, is an officer on the LCRA as well, so we value her perspective. Um, so with that, uh, I'll turn it over to Mr. Hayes. Thank you, Josiah. Uh, and I want to start with the observation that the our title of the program today is Unleashing the Texas Energy Colossus. I would suggest, and we'll, we're going to look at some slides to help us understand this better, is the Colossus is already unleashed. Uh, and indeed, it did not have to be unleashed because it's the genius of individuals doing deals and doing things that they know how to do when they're allowed to do it. Uh, it's sometimes called the free market. I think the term means so many things to many people, I uh, try to avoid it. But uh, that's what it amounts to, is that uh, it, it is unleashed, and uh, the biggest question probably is whether we will do those sorts of things that will shackle it. Uh, and 
With that, what I'd like to do is run through a series of slides to give us a little bit more background on some of this. And we're going to start off talking about energy, uh, because that's what this is all about. And uh, we tend to forget how central energy is to our modern, uh, not just economy, but lifestyle. We, we take it for granted. Uh, without modern energy, you know, I wouldn't be up here speaking into a microphone. We wouldn't be ready to look at PowerPoint slides. We wouldn't have the lights. We wouldn't have the, uh, we'd have some kind of heating probably, but it uh, wouldn't be near as comfortable. Uh, and there, there are those out there that romanticize the days before we had modern energy, uh, but the reality is it wasn't very pretty. Uh, and indeed, uh, that's how hundreds of millions of people or billions of people in the world still live. Uh, there are billions of people without electricity, and so when we start talking about doing programs, uh, of, say for carbon, that would effectively prevent India or people in India and people in China from having electricity, uh, we have to think twice about whether that uh, really is fair and makes sense because there are hundreds of millions of people in India still living in mud huts and cooking with dung. Uh, indeed, the, the first uh, real use of energy aside from fire was draft animals that allowed us to do things outside of our own body. And that's ultimately what it's all about, is maximizing the potential for individual action by allowing us to do things outside of our own body. Uh, Barbara Tuckman, the historian, uh, observed that in, uh, in a marvelous book uh, called A Distant Mirror, which is the history of the 14th century, that for a peasant in those days, the difference between truly abject poverty and being relatively well off by the standards of those days was simply having one draft animal. And so we might think about that, just we've effectively harnessed hundreds of draft animals every time we turn on our car to drive someplace. Uh, indeed, this is just one example of what modern energy has done. That, well, if you'll recognize, it's Houston. Lights, automobiles, we can't see the people in it. But as we know, Houston, except for maybe a little settlement that used to be called Allen's Landing, uh, wouldn't even be there if uh, we didn't have modern energy. This slide, uh, it's, and a lot of my slides come from EIA, but it, what it shows, just for a quick overview, is petroleum accounts for about 37% of our energy, natural gas about 25%, coal 20%, renewables about 8%, and nuclear about 8.4 percent. It's an interesting slide in terms of it traces by source where it goes and by in use transportation accounts for 27 percent of our energy usage. Next to electric power, transportation is the largest. And the thing we can note on here is for transportation 94 percent comes from oil, petroleum liquids. Two percent comes from natural gas. So that means 96% of transportation fuel comes from oil and gas. The other, the remainder 4% is basically biofuels, which we know means ethanol, which of course takes more energy to make ethanol than you get out of ethanol, not counting a host of other issues. Uh, and then to a lesser extent, uh, biodiesel. But so when folks start talking about, well, if we just have the right policies and by God pick the right winners instead of losers, in the market, of course, done through government planning, uh, and then we can get off, trans get off oil and gas for transportation within 20 years. It's uh, politely said somewhat nuts because 96% <laughs> comes from oil and gas. Uh, this gives another picture with projections. Most of the EIA projections right now go out to 2035, but the thing we see is that it continues to grow in usage. Now, they have They've revised it the last year or so to show a much greater increase in renewables. Don't know if that's going to happen or not. Uh, not that politics would have anything to do with projections. Uh, in Texas, we, uh, it's amazing how many Texans aren't aware of the centrality of oil and gas to our economy. Uh, used to be, but altogether, you get $8.5 billion in taxes and royalties, and that was in fiscal year 2009. Uh, it's huge, and it's going to stay huge. Uh, oil and gas salaries are some of the highest 
of any salaries, all the way from, and these are averages, because I know petroleum engineers that are making a lot more than that, but 99,000 a year for a young petroleum engineer, even down to administrative assistant, 35,000. When I say even down, they tend to start out lower and then uh, grow more over time, and they're critical to the process. But geologists, 55,000, and these are mostly younger folks getting started. So the point is, oil and gas jobs are good paying jobs, and they're central to our Texas economy. Uh, rig count went up, went down a little bit, and now it's, it's shooting back up in the last couple of years. Uh, rig counts don't mean quite the same thing they used to, uh, because from a single rig, being able to drill horizontal and tap vastly more reserves, uh, you don't need to punch as many vertical holes out there uh, to get many times the reserves that we did traditionally. Gas production dipped down slightly, but as we see average daily in the past uh, year has started to shoot back up again. The reality right now is we're awash with gas and folks are talking about getting export permits, uh, which is great, uh, but the oil and gas companies are largely at the moment targeting oil plays rather than gas plays because gas prices are down, crude oil prices have held up very good. Uh, oil production, in fact, we can see where it reached a, a low point in 2007 has really started to take off again by 2011. Uh, I want to talk for just a quick second about uh, imports because there's a, there are a lot of fallacies about imports. Uh, for one thing, 49% of imports come from the Western Hemisphere. Only, and let's keep this number in mind, 18% come from the uh, Persian Gulf where we worry about it. Uh, indeed, I, well, I've got another slide out of order. Imports account for about 50% of our energy supply. So if we remember the number we looked at earlier that oil is about 37%, well 50% of 37% is about 17 to 18%. Then we take the Persian Gulf. It's, it's a train. Oh, train. It's a train. Okay. <laughs> uh, I was wondering, were we getting feedback or was I? Uh, <laughs> we're, uh, anyway, 50% of the uh, crude oil is imported, so we take the 50% times the 37% of the uh, energy supply that comes from oil, that means about 17 to 18 percent of our energy supply is imported. Multiply that times the 18 percent of the Persian Gulf, we come out at about 1.7, 1.8 percent. So when everybody panics and says, my God, we got to spend billions of dollars on who knows what to get rid of all imports from the Persian Gulf, let's just remember, it's, it's significant, but 1.7 percent, we could live with a total cutoff of that. Now the price would go up. So just a little perspective, and indeed, the more recent projections are we're headed to being an ex net energy exporter. Uh, indeed, when we talk about imports, said 25 percent comes from Canada, 9 percent from Nigeria, I mean from Mexico. That means 34 percent, a third of our oil imports come from domestic U.S., I mean domestic North America. Uh, I should hope we're not going to be in a war anytime soon again with either Canada or Mexico. We seem to have settled a lot of those issues. Uh, this table, uh, I know it's almost impossible to read out there, but this is a distribution from 2009 of wells in Texas by production rate bracket. The reason I have it in here is we tend to focus on the huge wells, but if we go down 50% of the wells that produce what we'd call marginal production, both oil and gas, if you run the numbers on that, and these are relatively small wells operated by mom and pop operators, the big guys, because in part the way they do cost allocation for overhead, can't run a well uh, producing these low rates. But if you run the numbers on that, it's enough gas to fuel or to take care of over six million households a year. So the point is there's a lot of gas from these older wells, and when we think about policy, we need to make sure the rules work for the older wells and the mom and pop outfits uh, that may not be able to afford to pay me and other lawyers and consultants uh, to comply with the kind of programs that an Exxon or a Chevron, it's, it's just part of their routine business. 
Uh, this is the map, gas production in conventional fields uh, in the United States. And one thing to note about this is notice how this is the Gulf of Mexico, how oil and gas just stops right there. And there's none off the East Coast, very little off the West Coast. Well, I can assure you that Mother Nature did not in fact lay down a barrier offshore uh, Mississippi to say we're not going to have any oil and gas east of that. It's, it's kind of like we joke sometimes in Railroad Commission spacing regulation uh, proceedings where Gosh, the geologist is there testifying that miraculously the ceiling fault runs right along the fence line on the edge of the lease. Well, <laughs> it tends not to work that way. But this illustrates what government policy can do in terms of shackling. The unleashing is in this part of the Gulf of Mexico, and it's been going on for years. But the rest is shackled because of uh, ill-conceived policies. Uh, shale plays. We all know about the shale. Here's the Eagleford, the Barnett. Interesting thing, and going back to your quote from Yogi Berra about predictions, uh, one I like, uh, I don't agree with much of his economics. In fact, I'm not sure, well, very little. John Maynard Keynes, but he was great with aphorisms. And he one time said, never base policy on a prediction. Well, five years ago, when I first started putting these slides together and pulled this one down from EIA, the Eagleford was not even on there. It, nobody saw it coming until a few guys from Petrahawk put together a working team, got some old logs, started looking at lease positions, and brought in what's now one of the biggest boom areas in the United States. Uh, this is just another example offshore. Okay, shale. We hear a lot about shale. It's real. It's taken off. This is a recently released new EIA projection now going out to 2040. Interesting thing we can see back 2000, it was basically nothing. And many know the story. Uh, the Barnett Shale was initially really, everybody knew that the formation was there and the gas was in it, but didn't know how to get it out of it economically uh, until a fellow named George Mitchell poured a bunch of resources in to develop uh, both horizontal drilling and modern hydraulic fracturing and then others took off from there. And yes, it's a huge component. Again, if we don't screw it up and don't kill it through ill-fated policies. This is the import slide. This gives a quick picture of uh, electricity. Basically in Texas, 30-some uh, percent, it's dropping comes from coal. Nationwide, it's about 50%. Natural gas in Texas is about 50%, uh, and coal is about 20%. Uh, Kathleen White will talk more about the emissions picture that this shows. Again, natural gas is relatively clean. Uh, renewables is tiny. It's 8% here, and the wind and solar is only a total of about 12% uh, of that. So it's a rounding area. It goes to about zero. Uh, <laughs> lots of myths. One is that the subsidies given to uh, solar and wind just level the playing field from subsidies to oil and gas. Uh, the reality is uh, gas and petroleum liquids are about 25 cents, depending on how you calculate it, uh, per kilowatt, megawatt hour, whereas wind and solar are 100 times that. Uh, this shows relative cost for new production, shows gas is just dramatic. Wind is 50 percent more, not even counting the billions of dollars spent on new transmission lines uh, that are going to cost Texas consumers over a billion dollars a year. Uh, this is the bill that put in place some current renewable standards for Texas. And the main point, I say bipartisan illusion because the vote in the Senate was 29 to 0 and the vote in the House was about a 103 to 10. It just shows there are a lot of uh, illusions out there in terms of cost and what it's going to cost us. Uh, what we're finally talking about is, when, with these policy discussions, I like to think of at the intersection. What really becomes our energy, law and policy, is the intersection of policy, law, and politics. It's not all politics, like some politicians would think. It's not all policy, like po policymakers think. And it's not all law, like lawyers sometimes think. It's all three where they intersect. Two key resources for development over the individual human creativity and work and energy beyond the human body. 
uh, quoting David Landis from The Wealth and Poverty of Nations, all economic, meaning industrial revolutions, have at their core an enhancement of the supply of energy because this feeds and changes all aspects of human activity. Final question is, as Thomas Sowell likes to put it uh, very ably, who makes the key decisions? Are they made by, he likes to say, delegates through government agencies, or are they made by people who are directly involved in the uh, drilling of wells and in the energy field? Uh, that's not to say at all, I'm sure we'll have more discussion, there's a critical role for government, critical role for the Railroad Commission, both in terms of preventing pollution, as with TSEC, and in effectively administering property rights under our rule of capture. But ultimately, the, the energy to fuel the energy industry comes from individuals and their creativity. Thank you. Well, good morning and thank you all for the applause earlier. I'm now a month into this program, so feet are wet and probably doused after the legislature started this week. You know, it is, uh, John gave us a great overview and I think there's a lot going on. I've said the good, you, I think Josiah said it, the, the, you, um, with the tale of two cities, it was the best of times and the worst of times. And we've been through the worst of times in this state and I've been through it with a bunch of people so I like the best of times right now and so <laughs> I'll take it and I think we're not going any place Texas really is a leader and has been and our economy is about 25 percent of, of the industry of the oil and gas industry is our economy we created about 300,000 jobs directly in the oil and gas industry last year in this state directly so that's a lot of jobs and that has nothing to do with the dry cleaner down the street, the restaurant owner, and you go out to Midland, Odessa, and about half the restaurants are closed or they're only half of them are open because they don't have enough people to um, work. So that's an exciting thing, I think. So, uh, you know, there, there are, and that's happening all over the state now. Uh, I think it is interesting what's changed in the last two years, and I want to talk about that because I think we have expanded and, and, um, and changed where, the uh, market is. Obviously, we've still got a lot going on in East Texas. You know, obviously we still have stuff going on in East Texas. We still have stuff going on in, in the Panhandle. And we had stuff, in, we have things in the Barnett Shale, and I think just the numbers real quickly kind of give us a, a, um, a thought process about where we are in the different parts of the state. So the Barnett Shale obviously had, um, has, was a growth area and it slowed down a little bit because of natural gas, the prices. We had 36 permits we issued, we issued in 1993 from the Railroad Commission. In 2008, we had 4,145 permits. That number has gone down some, obviously, because of the price of natural gas, but we still have play going on. And, and I'm gonna talk as we go along about some of the things we learned out of the Barnett Shale at the Railroad Commission and some things we need to, and are trying to do better. But I think where the two explosions have been, obviously, are in South Texas, down in the Eagleford area. Um, as John said, we didn't know, we knew it sort of was down there, but we didn't know it existed. And I liked his map, it cuts off at Texas. We know it goes into Mexico. So at some point, if they'll allow us to uh, do help them with their drilling program, I think this play is, is bigger than we even have a, an idea about. In fact, some people believe the Eagleford area is as big as Alaska. So that is how big we potentially have just in one part of the state. In 2000, I'm going to go to our Eagle, to um, the Eagle Fort. In 2008, we the Railroad Commission issued 26 permits in the Eagle Fort. 26. In 2012, we issued 4,293 permits, and that's an approximate. I think that's through October of this year, so I'm sure it went up a few. So about uh, about 4,200 permits in the Eagle Fort area. That is a huge increase. 
And it is, um, and depending on where you are, one of the things we're continuing to find in the Eagle Fur is it's gas, it's it's um, oil, and it's liquid. So it's a combination of it's got a little of everything. And depending on what the prices are, depending on is what the permits we're issuing. So obviously a lot more oil right now in that part of the state than natural gas, but we still have a lot of product. And because of that going on, we're building pipe in this state too. So that um, going straight into the Corpus area, going into San Antonio, and also going down to Houston. So it's not just the drilling that's going on, but it's the pipes being built. And then I think the other part that obviously I'm more aware of just because I grew up out there is the Permian Basin. And I think the numbers out there are um, as amazing as any place else because we, uh, the Permian's a little bit different world. And the fact that there's at least 14 formations that we're aware of in the Permian and probably more than that. And Permian Basin is, uh, as y'all all know, Texas and New Mexico. But we've just uh, newly discovered, I guess, or it has been newly discovered by companies and they knew it was there, but are beginning to open up the Klein Shale. So that's one of the new plays and it's San Angelo Abilene, which again, we all knew stuff was there, but nobody knew how to get at it and, and the economics have changed. So to give you an idea, in the Permian in 2010, I'm not gonna tell you permits because that got a little crazy, but in the Permian in 2010, we, were, we produced 270 million barrels of oil in 2010. In 2011, we produced 280 million and that number is, we don't have 2012 in yet, but we know it's increased. And in fact, Bloomberg yesterday, I think, had an article that said Texas production is up 23% in a year. So that is what's going on in Texas all over this state. It's an exciting time. And I think one of the things we've got to make sure we do at the Railroad Commission is have good rules in place, but make sure we are not, as John said, make, um, preventing people from continuing to drill and because it's the s not just the big guys but the small guys who do who are out there finding the plays they may not be able to produce them but they're finding the plays. so I, I think those are just some basic numbers and how exciting we are in, te in Texas we are producing 1.3 million barrels a day that is about 25 percent of the country uh, Bloomberg's article also said we hit a high in the country as of January 4th, we now are producing just over 7 million barrels of oil a day in the country. So Texas is about 25% of that, and I think we're probably about above 1.3. That's a high for, um, for us in the country since the 90s, and, um, and I think that number will continue to go up. And despite the federal government, which Kathleen will get into in a minute, and there may be some plus and maybe minuses, but I think, um, but th that is one of the things that's going, that's a lot of what's going on in this state. It's an exciting time, and I think the Railroad Commission has been a leader for a very long time in this state, and in the country, not just with how we're getting our permits out, and yes, we all know we've got some issues, and we're working on some efficiencies, but we are down from six months getting a permit out, I think we're down to a day and a half, and if you, want it, if you want an expedited permit in three days, if you don't. Now, we still don't have our completion permits, and we're working on that, so give us a little bit of time. But, um, but we know that's some goals for us and some efficiencies, and, and, um, and I'm going to talk about technology because I think that's one of the places we definitely need to increase. But one of the other places I think clearly that this industry is having a huge impact in the state has to do with tax dollars. And so we, th yesterday the controller came out with new numbers for the estimates and she you know, said she underestimated by quite a bit. I think the reason she underestimated is nobody knew what was gonna happen with this boom. So if you look at, if you all hear rainy day fund, we are the rainy day fund, the oil and gas industry with severance taxes and $8.8 .8 billion is going into, is rainy day fund, that is, oil and gas, and that has nothing to do with the property taxes, the sales taxes, your school taxes, and every other tax that, is, that goes into the economy. Oil and gas is also paying into that too. So that is the impact on our economy directly into Texas, and directly, frankly, into the country, despite what um, the overregulation in other states, we know states are coming, in, and countries, quite frankly, are coming and looking to us. I, I, um, 
I will tell you a story. Milton Reister, was, uh, who is our new executive director, was at the commission, I think, for about two weeks, and a group from Italy came over to talk to us from the Royal Commission to see what we do. And they said, well, where, how long does it take y'all to permit? And we, they gave him numbers, and they said, oh. And he said, well, how long does it take y'all to permit? And, and he's, they said, about 11 years. So if that gives y'all an idea about how quickly and how well we're doing it, and yes, I know we've got, uh, we've got some improvement. And so one of the things I think we are going to the legislature and asking for and talking about, because this is where I think we learn from the Barnett Shale, I don't, th I think if you work, if you've ever looked at the Royal Commission website, frankly our website is awful. The technology is awful. This industry is the second most technologically advanced industry in the world, yet the Royal Commission technology, if you want to find something, it's there, but it, you may have opened six screens and 12 more windows before you can find it. So our goal is we have a technology, um, a new technology person who started about six weeks ago. And um, we call it, we, he, within the first week, had a working group, and I looked at the board, and it basically covered this whole wall of things they want to improve upon, and now they've whittled that down. But so, and they're asking for industry feedback, quite frankly, about what we do with our technology so you can find the information. We know with the Barnett Shell, we were out there active as an industry and as an agent telling people what was going on. Nobody knew where to find it. So that is one of the things we want to make sure the information is available and readily available, but also that your permits are being filed online, that it's not taking six, six months for a completion permit. That's ridiculous. That if a pipeline's been inspected that you know and that that information is available to the public, it's being done. We had over 100,000 pipeline inspections last year. We're doing the job. In fact, our agency has been cut in half in the last 15 years, and we have a boom going on. We're asking for more personnel and more money to pay those people because I think that's the right thing to do. I'm, look, I'm as fiscally conservative as anybody sitting in this room, probably more so because I've known it was the cheapo in my family. However, if you want us to work effectively and efficiently, which we need to, then we need more money in this agency. And I don't think industry is going to fight us about that. So I hope we get a lot of support for that. Thank you. Because I think it's important. You know, we've got some challenges ahead. We need to make sure we continue to be a leader in the industry, which we have been with not just our rules, but what we're doing in this industry and what we're doing in the state. So, and I, the other thing I want to just talk about I, for two seconds, we are in the middle of sunset. Um, we had recommendations come out yesterday from the legislature. For the most part, I think we agree with them, except I will tell you the ethics things that they want to do to us as commissioners. To me, if you're going to do it to one state agency, you ought to do it to all of us. So that is my plug. But I think for the most part, we, ha we are going to have a pretty clean sunset um, cycle. And that is a plus for us. Well, I'm glad it failed last time. And at the top of the agency, obviously, you've got three new people that weren't really there and active. David Porter was there last year, um, but was just getting his feet wet. So Barry and I are new, and we've got a new executive director. But we have a lot of good people at this agency who do a good job. And so we look forward to being a resource. And please come find us, because I'm going to be at the Capitol a lot. Didn't expect to, but I think I'm getting ready to take a budget lead for this agency. I think it's important. and um, and. You know, I look forward to working with all of y'all. And we want the input and want to know what's wrong with this agency. I call it the good, bad, and the ugly of the Railroad Commission. I have notebooks full, and some people who are sitting in this room know I've taken notes when I've asked them questions. And we are working on fixing some of those issues. So thank y'all for having us. I look forward to questions as we go forward. Well, to, to stick to the uh, best of times and worst of times <laughs> theme, um, I'm going to talk about some of the um, federal risks to this incredible um, energy boom that we have in the state of Texas. And I, a, a couple best of times factoids that uh, I just came across, which I just think, you know, it's easy to have them just float across your, your mind, but unbelievable. A, a recent a study by the highly respected uh, CIRA, Cambridge Energy Research Associates, uh, calculates in Texas alone that since 
um, um, the beginning of this boom, which I think they start about 2005 or something, the numbers, that 576,000 jobs have been cre created in energy and indirectly. It's just um, phenomenal. New jobs, new value. The economic pie is bigger. It's not redistributed, it's bigger. Uh, the other is, um, and this was uh, from a, a recent, uh, another from a heavy hitting uh, energy research outfit, Woods McKenzie, that, that concludes that the Eagle Fort area is now the largest in terms of capital value investment in the world. And is by, as we've heard by many, it's projected to grow. Again, uh, Woods McKenzie concludes that over 100 billion has already been invested there and that keeps going on and on. It's just so extraordinary. Um, how things can change. Um, on the worst of times, um, and sometimes it's hard to get in Texas, um, those of us um, who, who are involved with energy and are so excited and supportive of this energy boom that know that we have the first policies in the United States, and they, they articulate themselves explicitly to end the era of oil in our generation. I mean, to have at this time the, the energy opportunities this country has that they've never had that can be not only change our economy, but the global geopolitics. Um, and to have um, uh, the uh, policies um, um, that our president, Barack Obama, and his administration officials articulate to eliminate uh, fossil fuels as rapidly as possible. And um, plenty actions taken in the first administration I think taken perhaps most would, people would say more carefully than one would think in a second administration uh, that did not face re-election um, that were steps in that direction. Coal first was the first victim, um, mirroring the playbook of the Sierra Club's campaign to end coal. Um, EPA um, promulgated and adopted uh, more um, costly, stringent rules and the bulk of them um, directly um, most impact coal um, in um, the history, the 40 year history of that agency. Their impacts have not really been felt yet because it, they, many of them were just adopted, they're being litigated and all of that, but um, extraordinary because they're unlike other environmental mandates which make, um, um, require all kinds of stringent measures to reduce emissions or protect water quality, they are infeasible for coal. So it's not an additional cost of production to meet the standards, it's that that fuel source can't fit them. Other is um, EPA, although Congress repeatedly um, um, did rejected large um, carbon mandate bills, cap and trade, whatever you think, Congress never went forward. EPA did um, in what I, what I think under very questionable authority and said that carbon dioxide is a pollutant within the meaning of existing law. We don't need you, Congress. We have all the authority right now. Um, EPA went kind of light and is still going kind of light on what that authority meant. Um, but then they, um, it's not adopted and it's actually late, but it's the first really hard edged limit for carbon dioxide for um, power plants. And again, they flipped what most people understood is how the Clean Air Act. They said, you can have any kind of power plant you want as long as it has the carbon dioxide emissions of a combined cycle natural gas generation. It's infeasible for coal. So you can be coal if you're natural gas. Um, and um, that, again, it's not quite adopted, but there's already been, uh, and you all probably read if you're involved with energy, the, um, in, uh, the number of announcement of closures of existing coal-fired power plants and certainly no plans to build. But guess what? There's already litigation to force EPA to adopt the same rule, um, hard edge CO2 limit for refineries. That will get the energy <laughs> industry's uh, attention. There is not a kind of an alternative as if, I mean, there, and natural gas is an alternative fuel for electric generation. Uh, there's not really an alternative um, transportation fuel. So those are, those are all quite real. And um, I think the state, and it has, I mean, this is our attorney general and governor has taken on historic litigation challenging EPA rules and has been successful in part, but it's, it's not over. And I think it's very important to support the attorney general. But the most important is to protect state authority. 
over upstream oil and gas production. That has been throughout history. There's no big federal regulatory environmental laws like there are for um, industry, which in, in the Clean Air Act calls stationary sources for upstream oil and gas production. But it is starting. It is starting. I think as a former state regulator, I think under state authority, we can protect the environment better. Yes, and of course we can balance the economics, more importantly. We know our industries. We know our geologies. We don't do one size fits all on paper and say thou must obey. So preserving state authority through the Railroad Commission and through TCEQ is, I think, um, paramount. EPA has done the first ever um, hard-edged air quality regulation for fracking. And that's just been, in part, made effective. Again, it's in the early stages, and, uh, uh, and it's also being litigated and all that. But I think everything the state can do, the legislature can do, the leadership of our agencies to um, urge Congress and the administration that please let us retain the authority that the state has had to regulate all this. Because believe me, permits don't come out of EPA in a day and a half. <laughs> There's <laughs> somewhere between that and the 11 years in Italy. But I think it's a good story because I think, um, you know, the federal environmental laws and the first Earth Day and all that's 40 years ago. Lots has gone on and incredible environmental improvement has occurred in this country in part through those laws. All kinds of technologies have been developed to minimize adverse environmental impacts from industrial activity. So we know how to do it. So this incredible opportunity we have in energy comes at a time where we know also how to minimize um, adverse impacts. It should be a very good story. But the risks certainly are there in terms of, of very extreme policies about fossil fuels and about a federal government as the end all uh, regulator, but I so I hope I hope our legislature speaks to our large congressional delegation in Washington D.C. about you know you don't have to federalize fracking because it's nationally important. That's sometimes um, um, is the way the is issue is pitched. That um, our attorney general keeps up um, very aggressive, high quality litigation. That um, our governor speaks to other governors with energy opportunities. So state authority. On, on, on the oversight of upstream oil and gas production is retained. Thank you. All right, I think we're gonna do some question and answer now. There's a microphone. So if you have a question there. Yes, uh, I'm gonna continue on the Dick Kensian theme of the best of times and worst <laughs> of times. Um, to add to the best of times, um, I'm interested in your opinions on each of, on, on this issue, each of you, or all you all, to use the Texas terminology. <laughs> um, right now, you can get three, four, five times as much for natural gas being sold in East Asia, in China, Japan, and Korea, and in parts of Europe. And to switch to the worst of times, right now you have regulation by the federal government that is making it very difficult on both the infrastructure front and, the, and in so-called environmental regulation to block. Right now, you can get three, four, five times as much for natural gas being sold in East Asia, in China, Japan, and Korea, and in parts of Europe. And to switch to the worst of times, right now you have regulation by the federal government that is making it very difficult on both the infrastructure front and, the, and in so-called environmental regulation to block the shipment of this gas outside of Texas and other parts of the United States and to create the, the wonderful jobs and economic boom that all three of you have alluded to. I'm interested if each of you could comment on what can be done to remove those blocks and what the opportunity is. Thank you. Never mind just jumping in. Uh, yes, I, I think that's a huge problem. Uh, we have potential uh, massive markets worldwide for natural gas. Natural gas prices is getting relatively speaking depressed right now. Uh, they're around $4, which makes it difficult to support uh, these wells like in the Eagleford that tend to run about $6.5 million a piece uh, for, and that's 
for natural gas, uh, and that's why folks are targeting oil. Uh, I make no uh, reservations about saying that I, just as I believe in markets domestically, which are all about trade. I mean, that's all really a market is, is that folks trade. And throughout history, it's been chronicled over and over again in a, a fabulous book uh, called The Rational Optimist, going all the way back thousands of years, cultures that traded uh, grew, were prosperous, and created wealth. Uh, that's why seafar or coastal areas tended traditionally to do better than inland areas, because they could trade. Uh, the ships could reach the uh, seaside. Uh, yes, we have impediments to natural gas that come along two ways to the export. Uh, one is the uh, federal uh, statutes require an export permit to be obtained from the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission before gas can be exported. Uh, I think some very good arguments could be made that that's ridiculous. Uh, you shouldn't have to get a permit to export uh, natural gas any more than you should need a permit to export glass. Uh, it's, folks should be able to do it. As folks are suggesting that we need to remove uh, the impediments to the export, Unfortunately, we have, as, as very frequently comes along, and it goes by various names, crony capitalism and other things, some major uh, petrochemical companies uh, suggesting that, gosh, uh, we need to be careful about that. Well, what they're trying to do is protect lower prices, abundant natural gas for their petrochemical companies. And if we really believe in the principle of trade, uh, that's no more wise to do than back in 1975 in one of the earlier panics. The Railroad Commission entered an order that was known as Docket 600 to prohibit the building of new gas-fired electric generation plants. Because everybody says, gosh, we're running out of gas. Uh, suggested that that may well have triggered a lot of the downturn in the oil and gas industry in the 80s and 90s because folks then built nuclear and coal plants and it was coupled with the advent of the new Public Utility Commission where the electrics were going to be reviewed on their rates for the first time statewide. Well, the Railroad Commission did that and then proceeded to, and I can say it now because none of the then commissioners are actually even alive, uh, <laughs> it, was, it was somewhat amusing by uh, the later 70s when our commissioners were going around giving speeches about how terrible the new, what was first called the Coal Conversion Act, uh, became the Power Plant Industrial Fuels Act, part of Carter's energy plan, where everybody thought, gosh, we gotta move to coal. Coal is the wave of the future. Uh, and our, our folks here at the state level were giving speeches about how terrible that was, but it wasn't until 1979 that they eliminated the dock at 600 that told the electrics they couldn't build any more uh, gas-fired plants. So, uh, yes, that's the sort of thing that we can clear away the barriers and allow trade to flourish, and then we'll have lots more gas, uh, and it, I, I just think it'd be kind of cool to be a net exporter, which if we get rid of the undue barriers, we can do that. You know, one of the things that is finally happening, we have these LNG liquid natural gas terminals, and one of them finally has been allowed to turn and go back, uh, go out. So we've it took them a while. So I think that that once once people begin to to see that, and I I've said we've got some challenges and and can lead from Texas because we understand oil and gas. You've got now 35 states who have oil and gas production or some or are being affected by oil and gas. So you've got their congressional delegations who now want to see the jobs that we're seeing. You know, Ohio's been to this state several times, as has have, have other state leaders from other states. So I think we've got to go explain to Congress why those LNG terminals that we're still in process of building need to be turned and go out. But we've also got to explain to people within this country that no, we're not gonna run out. And I think that's a real fear. When, you, when I've been out, even in Texas, people wanna use our own resources first and foremost, which I don't disagree with. They don't want the prices to go up. But I don't think they understand the volume and amount of natural gas we have in this country. So we're going to have to start explaining to people for us to be able to get those laws changed, too, I think. I don't really have a comment. I, I share their perspective on this issue. Okay. I yes, think sir. there's another question back there.
Yes, sir, uh, there is, actually. Yeah, and I'm just, I'm just going to repeat the question for the microphones, a little English to English translation. <laughs> he was asking whether there was litigation about the uh, uh, liquefied natural gas plants, converting them uh, from import so that they could actually export that to other countries. Your opinions. When the XL pipeline comes online, how is it going to affect Texas? Well, I think first and foremost we're going to see jobs, and I think that's part of the reason, in my personal opinion, the Obama administration blocked it to begin with because the end jobs are going to be in Texas. We're going to be um, we're going to be refining. So, you know, the pipe is going to be, we're, we're starting our piece of it or we're trying to start our piece of it in Texas. So what those jobs are coming online as far as the building part of it. But the end refining ends up in Texas. So I think it's jobs for us in this state, frankly, and I think it's a good thing. Anybody else? I think there'll be less of a ga gap between the... the um, the globally determined Brent. price of us at Brent and West Texas Intermediate. I think those will come will come back together. And I concur and don't have anything to add. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question for um, Christy Craddock. Um, you mentioned the Klein Shell in West Texas, and I'm interested in knowing um, how much we actually know about its potential, uh, about how large it could possibly be or kind of what stage we're at in learning about it. And I think it's it's somewhat new and there are a couple of companies, Devon being one of them, that are leading the way in it. Um, there's a map that they sort of know, I think, and it, I saw it last week and should have brought it with me, but kind of goes from San Angelo, like I said, up to the Abilene area. I don't know that we know a lot, which um, we're beginning to. We kind of know the parameters of it. We also know there are multiple depths to it. So it's both a shallow shale and a, there's some deeper deeper potential to it. So um, they're still in development. But what, is, what has happened, and like I said, Devin's one of the leaders, but there are other smaller companies that have been out there drilling it for a long time. But um, And so s I asked somebody the other day, I said, are we going to have a lot of new um, mineral interest and a lot of new drilling. And they said, we'll have a lot of new drilling, but a lot of that land has been leased for years because those wells have been sitting there, different kinds of wells, but the fracking will be in the, um, the directional drilling will be new. So that's where the new technology is just being used in that part of the shale. Again, no, nothing to add except it's, uh, in addition, that shale is, uh, she mentioned earlier, Permian Basin is booming. Folks are building uh, pipelines, drilling wells, and it, what's kind of fun about that, even in the Eagleford, there have been some drilling over the years in, down in South Texas, we all know that, uh, but much more so in the Permian, and you can see how easy it was for th folks to, after seeing all the wells and if you fly, when you fly in and out of Midland, you can just see the well pads everywhere dotting the landscape to wrongly, incorrectly assume that, well, that means all the oil and gas is gone. And once again, through innovation and a system that allowed technology uh, and individual creativity to play, uh, along with strong property rights, that uh, this country is the, uh, really the only country in the world that has a system of strong private property rights in oil and gas. Uh, pretty much every other country in the world, the minerals are government owned. Mm -hmm. And that's one reason, for instance, as some have pointed out, uh, Mexico with tremendous potential uh, has hogtied itself. Uh, and so when we talk about the rules, both regulatory <coughs> and legislative, uh, probably the number one important rule is to pay attention to property rights. Number two would be contracts. And to keep the feds at bay. Uh, right. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I, I, there's one back there.
you know, I've been there only about three weeks, so um, tech, getting us through session, I think, is first and foremost important, and getting us through a sunset process that I think, like I said, is going to be a little bit, e little bit easier this time. You've got new commissioners. You've got an agency that's been more responsive to the legislature, so I think that'll be helpful. Um, increasing our budget. And we really, one of the, and it was done in August, and I don't disagree with it. In fact, we're refining it as we speak. We are, if you look at our salaries at the Railroad Commission, we don't compete, and I'm not talking in the industry, we don't compete with other agencies. So if you, the average job in the oil and gas industry is $100,000. We're not even close to that in the agency, but we aren't even close to TCEQ with first year engineers. So that's one of the asks we're going to be making, as well as we've only got 700 people on staff, which sounds big, but we have 10 field offices. And so about half are in Austin, and I joke you've got to get out of Austin. In fact, Travis County is one of the, the counties that we're not drilling in, so you've really got to get out of Austin <laughs> and go figure out what's going on in the rest of the state. So we've got, um, we've got we, we need to put more inspectors out in the regions, and so that is increasing our staff as well. Um, in fact, during the 90s when we had not a lot going on in this state, we had about 1,500 employees at the Railroad Commission. So if that gives you, we are a pretty lean and mean agency, but we need to make sure we continue to be effective and be a state leader instead of letting the feds come in and try to take over some things. Um, and technology upgrade, and, and I've said for a long time, I think one of the challenges we've got at the commission and at the industry is to educate people about what we do. I don't think the, the name makes not a lot of sense, and we'll see if the legislature decides to change that name. That's their decision. But whether they do or don't, people don't understand that the Railroad Commission is out inspecting what they do, that your permits have to come from it, and just good facts about the industry. You know, you, you look at this, wh whatever the new Matt Damon movie is, that there's not a lot of good facts in that movie. So we, as an industry, and frankly, I think a commissioner needs to take the lead and explain what's going on, not just in this state, but frankly across the country. And, and I've already outreached to several of our congressmen, and, and I think that's where Texas is at a, an advantage. As disparate as we they are in D.C., it doesn't matter if you're Republican or Democrat in this state. You understand that industry and energy is very important, and you want to make sure this industry does a good job and is still effective and is the leader in the country. So we are working with Republicans and Democrats. So right now those are our priorities, and, and as we get past session, I think you'll see me continue to stay involved. But I think getting the message out about what the Railroad Commission does, why we are a leader, why states' rights are important and people ought to be modeling themselves after us instead of Pennsylvania or the EPA and why fracking, you know, we, we started fracking in this state. We understand it. Come ask us questions instead of getting bad information out there. Thanks for the question. I just want to add very briefly that uh, absolutely second the push for better funding for the Railroad Commission, uh, to pay people better. Uh, we need quality people in the agencies, and we may not like a lot of what the government does, but quality people can make a real difference. And in an agency such as the Railroad Commission, that's critical not just to the environmental aspects, and if we don't have quality people and adequate funding, that provides fodder for those who say it should all be done by EPA and take it away from the state. Uh, but also, as I mentioned earlier, and we don't have time to go in detail, but truly the oil and gas regulation uh, since uh, 1919, uh, when it was first put in place in this state, has been a critical part of the way property rights work in oil and gas because of this rule of capture that's being dealt with on the water side and everybody's trying to figure out what to do. They could learn a lot from what we did in oil and gas. but. Since it is so critical, it means it's not exactly the same kind of regulation that we all rail against, that we need to get rid of the bureaucrats and the government, because without it, uh, the system just doesn't work very well. So uh, as a practitioner uh, who has to answer to clients about why is it taking so long to get such and such done, or you know, dramatic improvement has been made, for instance, in drilling permits, but in other areas, such as getting permits uh, for recycling, oil field waste, we have incredible delays. And uh, so 
commend what the commission is now doing to try to remedy some of that, and it, it is critical. I might, I might make a comment on that, which is just an agreement, but the, the, about the uh, property rights. Um, one often views government as, you know, inimical property rights, wants to diminish them or take them away, but you don't have a property right unless government protects it. Absolutely. I mean, that, that's government's obligation to protect, you know, our, what under law are the property rights. Yeah, indeed. There's an excellent book that's long out of print that came out in the 50s by a fellow named Willard Hurst called Law and the Conditions of Freedom in 19th Century United States. And he talks about how the rule of law that really developed property rights and contract rights for commercial transactions uh, really led to, and I think it's just uh, particularly appropriate for this program, his first chapter is called The Release of Energy. And he talks about how the growth of those systems really allowed the energy of the people to be released. And uh, I agree, sometimes, and I have to caution those who start railing too much against lawyers, and I tell you, I can rail the best uh, on that subject. Uh, but uh, my first question is, so would you rather we solve disputes the way they do in the streets of Baghdad? <laughs> As an attorney, I can say it's the 95% uh, of uh, bad attorneys that are giving the rest of us uh, a bad Always, attorney, so. always. <laughs> That's, right. That's right. Are there any uh, other questions? There's one. Uh, exactly how does the Railroad Commission interact uh, with industry with regard to water recycling? I think that's an important issue, particularly in our part of the country. You know, I agree, and, and thank you for the question. And, and actually, one of the things we, we've been doing is encouraging people, because I don't think we should overregulate people to do it, I, because I don't think overregulation works. But I think encouraging people to, to, to recycle, and, and in fact, I've said several times, that it is not a, this drought has not been a bad thing for technology because what has it done is encourage people to w and want to companies to recycle use different um, different things like propane instead of using water for fracking and um, and use different technologies use less water too so I think we've still got that challenge and Texas still needs to put a good finalize their water policy I think in the state too so it may affect us and we're going to be watching that a lot. But if you've got some thoughts about it, you know I'm always open to listen to you, too. Sorry. Uh, I think that's it. Um, thank you for coming. It's been, uh, I'd like to thank the panelists. <laughs>